Hi, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. It's HCAM's program that, uh, that talks with people who have uh, interesting jobs, who, uh, who uh, are, are local in nature. And we're making a little bit of a shift today because uh, we have someone uh, we're going to be talking with who uh, has earned the right over a number of years uh, to be an honorary citizen of Hopkinton, and that's uh, Dave McGilvery, the race director for the Boston Marathon. But uh, as important, uh, the founder of uh, DMSE, Dave McGilvery Sports uh, Enterprises. We want to talk to you about a lot of stuff, Dave, and I, I can tell you we're not going to get it done in 30 minutes, so we're going to have to have you back. Okay, uh, I'm more than happy to come back. Good. Happy to be here now, though. I've, I've read your book. Yes, sir. The Last Pick, and, uh, and maybe that's where we start, but I, I can't help but, uh, but mention this. There's a quote on the back of the book from uh, Ambie Burfoot. It says, Dave McGilvery may have been short as a boy, but he has come a long, long way since then. I know few people who have accomplished as much as Dave and none who have done it with his, with his grit courage, humility, and unyielding determination. Pretty high praise. Coming from someone like Ambie. Yeah. Very nice. Let's start with this. Sure. Where'd you come up with the name, and what's the, what's the focus of the book? Well, um, I grew up in Medford, Mass., not too far from here. Yep. And when I was um, a young boy, I wanted to be one thing, and one thing only. And I wanted to be an athlete. And unfortunately for me, I sort of had a challenge, and my challenge was that I was, uh, well, vertically challenged. And all my friends, obviously, were, the athletes were much taller and much stronger, and I was typically always the last one cut when I went out for the high school teams, baseball and basketball, or when my friends bucked up for sides, and they would say, I got Tim, and I got Ralph, and I got Fred, and I got Pete, and I got Jane, I have Sally, I mean, they picked the girls over me. And then the finally, okay, I, I got Dave. Inevitably, I was always the last pick. And for me, I, you know, I, I didn't have an illness. You know, thank God I didn't have any kind of leukemia or cancer or heart conditions or anything. But I, I, I felt like I, I, I did have a, a challenge, and that was emotionally feeling rejected, feeling not wanted, um, and that was. That was very, very difficult for a young boy who wanted to be accepted and who wanted to make the team and, and always being turned away. So that's why I started to run, because nobody can cut you from running. And I've run about 150,000 miles since. And over the years, you know, I've been uh, able to use my running to, uh, to create a business, combined a hobby with a vocation, been able to use my running to raise money for worthwhile causes, raise my, use my running to hopefully inspire other people to do the same. And then eventually I decided to write a book and appropriately name it The Last Pick. All right, so we, you, I want to go, uh, let's, let's go back now to the, to the education stuff mm -hmm. and how you ultimately uh, uh, began to meld the, the hobby and your interest and the passion. Mm -hmm. uh, where'd you go to school? Medford High School. And then, then where? Merrimack College. Not Merrimack Denver, College. Yeah. What'd you study there? Math. Math? Math. How in the world? Well, no, that makes sense though, doesn't it? Logic. Running. You know, timing. Dis just just organ organization, you know, detailed orientated, that's my nature, that's my core. And the reason why I, I went in that direction is because I was, um, I, I, I was good at math. <laughs> and my counselor says that's maybe the direction you might want to go, become an actuary or a statistician, things of that nature. So, so I went to work when I graduated from, well, Merrimack College. I was valedictorian in high school. I was valedictorian in college. Really? Yeah, not because I was the, necessarily the smartest kid, but I had a hard work ethic. And I just wanted to get the most out of each and every day and knew that once I graduated, I'm not coming back. So I might as well build a foundation that I can use going forward. And, and I, was, uh, I was working at the Hancock Tower at the time for a benefit consulting firm. And that's when I decided, um, I looked outside and I saw Fenway Park from my window and, and um, I saw a sign out in right field that said, help make a dream come true, support the Jimmy Fund. And I thought, 
I got to do something here. And I was just, again, so much into my running. And that's when I made the decision to run across the United States to benefit the Jimmy Fund. And it just took off from there. And after I ran across the country, when I finished, this is an interesting story, when I finished, my boss called me up right away. I finished on a Tuesday in Medford and then into Fenway Park. And uh, he said, you, you got to come back to work tomorrow, Wednesday. I said, I just ran across a continent. Can I have a day <laughs> or two to, to recover? And on Friday, I, I, I got a termination letter. And um, things happen for a reason. And it was fortuitous that that had happened because I probably would have continued to pursue that even though that was not my passion. And that just forced me to think outside the box and say, well, what do I really want to do in life? And then I opened up an athletic and footwear clothing store in my hometown. Then I started putting on events to promote the store. The rest is history. A thousand events later, here I am. Where did you get the, the, the work ethic? Were you born with that? Did somebody, I think did so. Somebody, uh, yeah, it's in, it's in the genes, I suppose. You know? And I think by being, a, being small in stature and, and wanting to pursue athletics, I, I think I had a, like a Dustin Pedroia. You, sometimes you have to scrape and, and, and grind a little bit harder to, to, get, to get to the top. So it, it was something I, I, I inherited and then I, I fine-tuned as I, as I was younger. You know, sometimes I got in some little brawls just to defend myself, you know? Yeah. So, um, so but, and, and that's why becoming an endurance athlete seemed to make all the sense in, in the world for me at the time. Did you, when you were at the, at the college level, what, uh, you, you ran track, but did you, did, were you a distance runner then? Yeah, I mean, mostly I have slow t twitch fibers, you know, yeah. so, um, yeah, endurance is really, I, I, I can't sprint at all. Um, but endurance was, so I ran track and I, and I played a little soccer. And, and then that was it. That's all I did in, in sports itself. Um, so, um, and that's when I decided, you know, maybe that's the direction I want to take with my career. You know, the, the, I would have thought the, the progression of the career would have been the other way around. You mm. might have been involved in sports management and then, uh, or creating events and then looking uh, to do something like this run across the country, but it's the opposite. Yeah, it is. And you know, it was interesting, when I decided to start my business, Dave McGilvery Sports Enterprises, you know, like a lot of things in life, you know, people doubt you, you know, uh, and people said, well, you're gonna, you're gonna what? You're gonna earn a living by putting on road races? And back then, it wasn't fashionable. There was the Boston Marathon right. and a few other events, and that was it. But I had a vision, and I've always felt that the genius is seeing it in the seed. And my vision was that, yeah, maybe at that time, running, as it was understood, was more of a competitive sporting right. event. Right. And I knew that, and I was too. That's why I did it, to be competitive. But I said, you know, someday America's going to get it, and they're going to realize they need to focus on themselves, that the most important person in the world is is yourself. You have to take care of yourself. And that uh, the walls of intimidation would crumble someday. And people are going to get off the couch and get out there. Instead of being a spectator, they're going to be a participant. And it happened, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, philanthropy entered. And that incentivized people even more, a greater purpose to do this. Um, so, and now this industry is just off the charts. I can't even keep up with it. So many people are participating in road races and triathlons and just mass participatory athletic events. And uh, so it's become a, an incredible industry. Let's go back to this. Um, uh, I'm interested in uh, going back to the running, run across the country. And, and, and I want you to break down what it takes to do that. And it's not, it's, it's a lot more than just being able to run and the endurance right. part of it. What, so as you, as you, from the, the moment that thought entered your brain, right. what are the components that lead into that ult, the, achieving that objective? That's a good question because it's a, a significant goal and it can, it can be daunting if you just look at it by stepping back and say, how am I going to do that? Like a lot of goals. But what I decided to do is break it up into small pieces. I said, okay, you know, using my operational, technical, logistical mind, I said, what, what do I need to do? Well, the first thing I needed to do is, um, is make the commitment. 
So before I made the commitment, I wanted to research it. Like, what would it take uh, to okay. do this? Yeah. So look into it. Have any, has anyone else done it? You know, that sort of thing. And then, um, and then that's when I decided to partner with the Jimmy Fund. And uh, like that, that uh, scenario I just said about looking out the window and seeing the, the sign, I picked up the phone and called the Jimmy Fund, and a guy by the name of Ken Coleman answered the phone. And Ken was the voice of the Red Sox right, and right. the executive director of the Jimmy Fund. And I said, hi, Mr. Coleman, my name is Dave, and I want to run across the country for the Jimmy Fund. And, you know, after he picked himself up off the floor, he's like, well, you know, why don't you come on in and talk to me about it? And bang, he agreed to do it and worked with the Red Sox, and we decided, decided to do that. So, so the commitment was made, not only to me now, but I made a stronger commitment, and that was to the Jimmy Fund and to those kids. So then I had to learn what was this Jimmy Fund all about. So I went and visited the Jimmy Fund in the clinic and saw those kids. And, and again, everything just came full circle to me. As, you know, the, I saw the kids and I knew at the time that the battle that I was about to fight by running over five and a half million footsteps across America was no way as difficult as the battle that these kids are fighting for their own life. And it's not fair. And why are they sick? And so <clears throat> I was even more incentivized to get the job done. The next step is earning the right. You can't just recklessly go run across the country. You have to do the, the right things. Now, there's no books out there, how to run across America in 10 easy steps. You have to figure it out for yourself. So I did the appropriate training. I gave myself some time, four years, to train for this thing, to focus on it. Everything I was doing was focused on this one goal of mine. And then, um, and then I got the team together and went out to the West Coast. And, and then I, I <clears throat> started the trek. And, Basically, it took me 80 days. I averaged 45, 50 miles every day. But, um, but I didn't think about 30, 452 miles. I thought about, I ran 10 mile splits. Ran 10, took a break, ran 10, took a break, ran 10, took a break throughout the day. So my theory was breaking it up into smaller pieces. And then once I got that done, just focus on the next piece. And once I got that done, focus on the next one. So it's all about immediate gratification and um, not thinking about the totality of the, of, right. the, of the goal. And that's how I was able to, to get through it. How did you get, uh, you talk about a team. How, uh, who, who made up the team? What, no, what, it was really difficult to get three, I, I wanted to get three guys in a motorhome to help me out. One to do PR, one to drive the motorhome, and then one maybe to ride a bike next to me every now and then, things of that nature. And maybe, you know, change it up throughout the day. So I asked a whole bunch of my friends if they'd be willing to do it, and I couldn't get anyone to do it. Now, who wants to go across the country in three months at a snail's pace, right? So word just got out that this guy, Dave, was going to run across the country, and he's looking for you know, some support crew. And, and then I piecemealed three guys together who didn't even know each other, and I didn't even know them that well. One of them I knew a little bit, but not that well. And I had no choice. So we decided, OK, we're going to do this. And uh, we all got along extremely well and, and made it happen. What were the, uh, what, besides the physical stuff, and I, I know in the book you make reference to running through Pennsylvania. Hmm. Uh, I've always wanted to ask you about that, why that was uh, so difficult. But yeah. what, what were the challenges? Uh, I mean, mainly, uh, I, I, you know, some of it was emotional, being, being far away from home. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but anytime I set these goals, it's not just the physical thing. It's like, how can I set this up to, um, gain some benefits emotionally and mentally. So I decided to run west to east for three reasons. One is I thought, to, you know, they said the prevailing winds go west to east. Well, that's a bunch of malarkey because I, I felt like it was in my face the whole time. <laughs> Going, I thought I, if I get, um, get through the desert and over the Rockies and get through in a healthy manner, it's just like clear sailing from here. But then I hit Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania was just this. See, the desert was 120, 130 degrees. I just got up early, got it done before midday, and then I rested, right? The Rockies was just up and down, and that was it. You know, a couple of days up, a couple of days down, and I was through the Rockies. Pennsylvania was 350 miles of under, almost like the Boston Marathon course. Right. Same kind of thing, a lot yeah. of downhill. It beat you up. Yeah. And so that's what really affected me, kind of a thing. And the last reason why I went west to east was because I was running home. And every step I was taking was closer and closer to home. It's like a magnet. Home was a magnet. It kept drawing me and drawing me. So as, as I got more and more physically sort of beat up, I got more and more emotionally strong. So it worked in reverse. And so that, that was able to carry me the whole way. So, so these are the types of things that you know, I thought about in advance and planned for to get me through what otherwise could have been a, a 
you know, something where I might not have ever made it. Right, right. So you really create, you, your business grew out of the fact that you didn't read about event management, you, you I, lived it. Yeah, exactly. In fact, the run across the country was actually the first event that I ever produced. Just happened to have one runner in it instead of 20,000. You know, the, and the other thing is you hooked up with an organization that's uh, you know, preeminent. I mean, the, the Jimmy Fund and Dana Farber is. Yeah, and then I ran up the east coast of America uh, a couple of years after that with Bob Hall pioneer of wheelchair racing right. in America and the first wheelchair athlete in the Boston Marathon. And Bob ran and I ran from Winter Haven, Florida back up to Boston. So I did that for the Jimmy Fund. And then I triathloned around New England for the Jimmy Fund. And I finished that one in what's now called Gillette Stadium. And I've done 24 hour swims, 24 hour bike rides, 24 hour runs around my age on my birthday. And you know, all these things, I primarily hook them up with, you know, a, a charity just because I feel like if I'm going to go through that effort, I might as well, you know, try to help someone else in the process. You know, let me ask you a personal question about, um, about self-care. Because in order to do the kind of things that you're talking about, you got to take care of yourself. You mentioned that earlier. Yes. Can you f talk, to, talk to me a little bit more about yeah. self-care. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a time when I felt guilty every time I woke up and went out the door and worked yeah. out. Because yeah. I said, I'm being selfish here, right? And as I got older, I realized, you know, you, that's just the, it's just the opposite. You're being unselfish because you're taking care of yourself. Because if you take care of yourself, you don't eventually burden anyone else to have to take care of you for you. And you put yourself in a position where you're able to help other people. So the quick story is this. Um, you know, I've run 150,000 miles, I've run 138 marathons, I've done nine Ironman triathlons, I've run up the East Coast, run across the country, blah, 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 all these things, right? So, of course, in my mind, I'm invincible, right? I'm Superman. You know, not, not, there's no crypt, kryptonite in my, in my world. Right, right. And then about a year and a half ago, I was out running and I could feel some tightness in my chest and I was like, what's going on here? And, and it was very unusual because I'd never felt that feeling before. It's like I was running at altitude when I was right here at sea level. And I ch checked in with Mass General Hospital and cardiologist and did echocardiograms, stress tests, EKGs, everything. Nothing. No, nothing wrong with you. So nothing wrong with me. I can't breathe. Something's wrong with me. So I said to the doctor, you've got to give me the big boy test. Right? You've got to look under the hood here. So they brought me back in and they did a CAT scan. And they found all kinds of calcification. And then they gave me an angiogram. And I'm lying on the operating table in, in, the, in the Mass General Hospital, and the doctor comes in, and he says, there, and there, and there, and there. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was stunned. I had all this blockage and This plaque. is more than one there. There's a lot more than one there. Dan uh, I had severe coronary artery disease a year and a half ago. And you know, I, I, as I was looking at the monitor, I thought I might have six months left because of that. I'm saying to myself, how did that happen? How'd that happen? I've, I've done all this exercise. I've taken care of myself. Yeah, I have a history in my family of cardiac challenges, so it's genetic somewhat. But then I realized it was a lot of it was self-inflicted because I felt, you know, obviously as an athlete, you know, endurance athlete, you feel if, it, if the furnace is hot enough, it'll burn. If you go out for a 20 mile run, you come home. I deserve that. It's a reward, whatever that is, the cookie, the cake, the ice cream, or whatever. Right, right. 59 years of that add, added up. Right. And for the first time in my life, I, I realized a lesson that, you know, finally, lucky for me, saved my life. And that is just because you're fit doesn't mean you're healthy. And I thought it did. And, you know, I got a lot of friends, and you know some of them, that went out for a run one day. Yep. Great athletes yep. never come home. Yeah. And so I, I said to the doctor, and I'm lying on the operating table, I said, Doc, I, I got to ask you one question. He said, what? I says, is this reversible? And he said, well, it depends. It depends on what? He said, it depends on the person. I said, well, you're talking to him. <laughs> and he said, you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely possible. And I said, well, sign me up. October 9th, 2013, I signed on the dotted line that I'm changing everything. Everything from my diet, my nutrition, my you know, sleep habits, because I always think sleep's overrated, stress from the bom bombing in Boston, and just all the, my life, my style. I said, you gotta pull back a little bit, buddy, and you gotta take care of yourself, because I'm constantly thinking about other people and not me. And that's the worst thing you could ever possibly do. So I changed everything, and in a matter of four months, I lost 27 pounds, I lowered my cholesterol level by over 100 points, 
And I decided to go back to Hawaii for the first time in 25 years to do the Ironman Triathlon in October. And before I could go, they said over there in Hawaii, we, we want you to come back, but you have to get a note from your doctor. That's never happened to me before in my life. And he said, well, we've got to reverse this thing. So about a month before I went to Hawaii, we went back in, did another angiogram, and he said that I had improved my, reversed my coronary artery disease by over 40% on my own without medication. Take care of yourself. What kind of changes you make in your diet? I, I mean, generally speaking, when people say, what is my diet? My diet is um, I don't put anything bad in my mouth, only good, good stuff in so many words. I mean, I got rid of all the stuff that I was eating, you know, whether it's any, any of the sugars or fats or red meat and alcohol. Not that I was a, drank a lot, but I haven't had a beer in 18 months. So Soda, everything, gone. And I took dietary supplements and just, and one, one other thing I changed was instead of eating big, three big meals yeah, every day, yeah. I, don't, I don't do that anymore. I graze all day long. Makes a big difference. I'm never hungry anymore, so I don't eat a lot. So that's what, and the lower you weigh, the, the better you feel. Just, just what it is. That sounds, it, it sounds the way you've explained it, that it's easy, and we, we, we know it's not. That's, it, the, making those kind of lifestyle changes are, are difficult, but. It's easy it, if you look at a monitor, uh, yeah, and good your point. life is, ready, is flashing yeah. by. Yeah. You don't want to get to that point, because it might be too late. But it's also interesting that your background is, uh, the, 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 it, it makes sense, actually, you know, this sort of self-discipline, uh, good work ethic, uh, you, you spot out how many miles you've run, uh, you know, like a mathematician would. Mm -hmm. uh, this all seems to now make sense, make sense. And, and, and yeah, and fit in. Mm -hmm. It, you got an opportunity to deal with people all over the country, mm -hmm. but let's let's focus on the the kids in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. If you were to, what kind of message would you, if we had all the high school track athletes in a room, and there are a lot in Hopkinton, as you know, what and you had 15 minutes. No, better yet, you had five minutes. Mm -hmm. What are the key messages you, you would deliver to them? I think the whole essence of existence is self-esteem, self-confidence, feeling good about yourself. People are in prison because they had no self-esteem and something went wrong. Right. People are overweight because they don't have self-esteem. What I try to do is work on making people feel good about themselves, that we're, we're, we're the most important person in the planet is you, and focusing on you first, and taking care of yourself. Um, I mean, and, and the whole concept of setting goals and not limits. A lot of people say to me, oh, I could never run a marathon. I say, you know something? You're right. You're right. With that attitude, you could never run a marathon. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to? If you want to, then you can. You know, it's just, it's all attitude adjustments. Things of that nature is where I would drive it, you know. Um, you know, Tim, I run the marathon every year. I finish last every year. Of course, I start last, but I finish last every year. Guess what? I'm okay with that because I finish. That's the whole idea. You know, I'm going much faster than the person on the couch. And that's what we have to instill in, in kids today is that, you know, the whole idea is they can accomplish. You know, it's funny, a lot of people ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up, you know, kind of a thing. And I said, well, I'm not really sure. And I was, um, I was driving down Route 93 about six months ago, and I saw a billboard. And the billboard had one word on it. And I looked at that billboard, and I said, that's what I want to be. That's it right there. You know what it said on the billboard? No. Accomplisher. Huh. That's all it said, accomplisher. It was a Girl Scout message, but it said accomplisher. And I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be an accomplisher. I want to get things done like you do. <laughs> you and I do. Other people do. I want to get things done. It doesn't really matter what it is. I'm not asking kids to go run or play sports, but find your passion and get it done. That's what I try to tell them. Yeah, and that, 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 that mess, I'm not so sure that that's a very clear message. And I'm, I'm not so sure that, uh, that we're getting it done in terms of transferring that message. I understand. I do a lot. I've done 1,900 motivational speaking appearances. I, I, I spoke at my kid's school a week, two weeks ago for the first time ever, but I speak at school. I'm going right now 
I leave here, I'm going to Providence College, speaking to 300 students at Providence College at 7 o'clock tonight. That's what I'm going to tell them. Athletes or students in general? Just students in general. Yeah, this message that uh, that you're delivering it cuts across. It's not. It's it's it simply is not an athletic. I, un I understand no, it isn't. them. It's not an athletic. It message. isn't. It isn't. Well, Dave, you know we've we've uh, our time here is now almost up, and yep. uh, we, I think it's important that um, if you're willing, that we we that you come back and we talk a little bit about about the business yeah, side of, that would be of great. what you're doing. Yeah. Because I think that's important, and there are a lot of lessons to learn. I can, I can tell you this, that um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things. And a lot of people are accomplishers. Mm -hmm. But um, you live it. And um, quite frankly, it's, uh, it's a privilege mm. to uh, have an opportunity to talk with you and explore this. And we'll look forward to the next time. So thank you. Feelings mutual. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive and Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie days and showtimes. Troop 72969 from Hopkinton. We would like to thank Mr. Trojan for the awesome tour of the HCAM studio. If you are interested in fun and adventurous field trips, we recommend one, to learn a Girl Scout troop. And two, visiting HCAM to see how local television is created and produced. We also want to give a shout out to Kalala Supermarket to thank Dale for our Girl Scout troop tour. And for always giving us a space to set up our cookie booth.